17th century Edinburgh is estimated to have been home to around 50,000 people. It's 50,000 men, women and children crammed into the tenement buildings that lined the Royal Mile and narrow artery-like closes that branched off it. The city was cramped, dirty and overcrowded. The Great Plagues of Edinburgh ravaged the city in 1604 and 1645, with the latter killing approximately 50% of the population. Dysentery was rampant and crime was a plague in itself. You could be forgiven for thinking that life in Edinburgh in that time was hell. For most it was, but for others it was a time of prosperity. One of those people was Major Thomas Weir, a man who lived an incredible life and who'd later earned the moniker the Wizard of Westbow, and his sister Jean, more commonly known as Grizel. Thomas and Grizel were born towards the end of the 16th century and were raised on the west coast of Scotland in the small Lanarkshire village of Carlew. The Weirs were wealthy. Their father was Laird of Kirkton and known for being as treacherous as he was rich, and their mother was a renowned clairvoyant. She was seen as a benevolent power to some, a sorceress to others. She's said to have bore a witch mark on her forehead and was apparently able to tell what the family were up to, no matter how far removed from her they were. Grizel is quoted as saying that the mark allowed her to see the secretest thing that any of the family could do, though done at the greatest distance. However, this gift of sight seems to have had its limits, as Thomas was witnessed standing in a field, behaving in a manner unbecoming of his station, and reported to the local minister. As was the way in those days, the young girl who reported the lascivious behaviour was unable to corroborate her claims and she was whipped through the town for slandering such a holy man. Although nothing much of their earlier life is recorded, it's clear Thomas Weir was well educated and a deeply religious man of tall, slender build. In later life he'd served for many years in the military, fighting in the 1641 Irish Rebellion and joining the anti-monarchy Scottish army. When he retired to Edinburgh with Grizel, believed to have been around 1649, he earned the nickname of the Bowhead Saint. This nickname arose due to his house being near the top of the West Bow, a street in the old town, and Saint being a popular sobriquet for passionate Calvinists. Weir was held in such high regard that he was given the role of guarding arch-royalist the Marquis of Montrose, John Graham. Graham was to eventually be hanged, and it's said that on his way to the gallows, Weir famously blew smoke in his face, much to the crowd's delight. Due to his esteemed reputation, the residents of the city bestowed upon him the highest honour they could, when they deemed him to have been someone whom God had raised up to support the cause, and named him as captain of the City Guard. The City Guard were an organisation rumoured to have been around since the days of the Templar Knights, but widely accepted to have been formed in 1513 after the events of the disastrous Battle of Flodden. A pious man who was often found to be praying and said to be able to quote scripture at will, what he did next was to shock 17th century Edinburgh to its ancient core. Weir held many sermons in his Westbow home, doing so right up until he was an ageing, frail 71-year-old. It was at this time that we'd learn of the double life of the venerable Major Weir and his sister Grizel. Suspicions began to be aroused when, one evening, just on the stroke of midnight, a young lady and her maid witnessed the sound of frivolity and drunkenness coming from the area of the Weir's home. On closer inspection, they saw three women merrymaking with the Major, and, disturbingly, a woman said to be twelve foot tall who stood at the foot of the stairs to the house. The giant turned and walked away with an unnatural movement, cackling and writhing as she moved before disappearing up a close. As before, the women were not to be believed. During one sermon in 1670, Weir rose to his feet, and while the people gathered listened, he confessed to a life of sin and debauchery. In front of his stunned guests, many of them upstanding members of the community, 
he confessed to being in league with the devil. Before God, I have not told you the hundredth part of that I can say more, and that I am guilty of. Those gathered before him listened unbelievingly to what Weir had to say. His story was one of perversion and black magic, having been in the service of Satan for fifty years or more. He confessed to having carnal knowledge with Grizel, with them effectively living as man and wife. Not only that, but while supposedly praying with many of the daughters and wives of the noblemen of the city, he'd instead had a far more intimate relationship with them, occasionally using black magic to enter the houses of some of these women in the middle of the night. He also confessed to conjuring demons and sins far too offensive to repeat here. Initially, no one could believe what they'd heard, and believing Weir had taken leave of his senses, the congregation at first tried to cover it up, and this they did. For several months, the Major's confessions were kept secret, but word gets around in Edinburgh, and he and Grizel were eventually imprisoned in the old Tollbooth jail. Here Grizel, who could have saved them both by refuting her brother's claims, also confessed to having met with and striking a bargain with the devil. She instead corroborated the Major's story, Grizel was said to confess to being a witch since birth, having gained the powers from her sorceress mother, and to have been transported to Musselburgh from Edinburgh in a horse-drawn coach made of all of fire. And it was from her that the stories of Major Weir's enchanted staff would be told. This staff was later said to run errands for him and walk several paces in front of him. Thomas would tell tales of flying over the city in Satan's flying chariot that spurted flame as it came to collect him. While imprisoned, a bag containing some of Thomas's belongings was thrown into a fire, where it was said to have danced in the flames as if possessed, and circled and sparkled like gunpowder. When the time came for the weirs to pay for their crimes, being a man's world at the time, the charges of sorcery were dropped against the Major, and he was sentenced for only the more earthly crimes but Grizel was charged with being a witch. Because of this, the Major was to be strangled at the stake near Leith, then his corpse burned, and Grizel was to be hanged near her home in the grass market. Before being killed, Weir is said to have uttered the words, Let me alone, I have lived as a beast and I must die as a beast. He was then strangled and burned. As he was burning, his staff was also burned, and it was said to dance and jump in the flames. Grizel, however, went out fighting, and it's said that, on the scaffold, she cast away her mantle, her gown tail, and was purposed to cast off all her clothes, before all the multitude. Even after death, the weirs still terrified the citizens of Edinburgh. The Major's house was said to be haunted by their ghosts, and lay empty for the best part of a century. Witches were seen to appear at the windows of the house in the dark of night. Our giant was again seen, as one witch was said to be as tall as two ordinary females. Wizards on horseback and thundering hooves were often witnessed near the old house, and, on occasion, the devil was said to have been sighted also, thundering down the lawn market in his black coach. Grizel's apparition is said to appear in windows in the grass market, Although being hung, her screaming face, surrounded by flames, is seen peering in at terrified people before she quickly vanishes. The cursed house lay empty for over a century until a tenant was eventually found, when Sergeant William Petullo and his wife moved in. The Petullos couldn't go a night without something horrifying happening. As they retired to their beds, from the embers of their fire, a calf appeared and walked towards them stopping and resting its forefoot upon the bottom of the bed. Upon seeing this, the Petullos understandably moved out. The house, again empty, was believed to have been demolished towards the end of the 19th century. In fact, Sir Walter Scott wrote in 1830 that the property was no more, but where it once stood now stands a Quaker meeting house. And here, staff have reported seeing the apparition of an aged, tall, thin man, dressed in 17th century clothing, passing between rooms. In 2014, new research discovered that rather than being demolished, the Weir's house had instead been incorporated into the structure of the Quaker Meeting House. 
which leaves you wondering, do the devils of the grass market still stalk the streets and closes? <laughs>